Hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Thanks for being here. My name is Craig Damian Smith. I am a senior research associate at the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration at Ryerson University. Uh, and I was the founding associate director of the Global Migration Lab. And I'll just say that I'm proud of my students and ex-students for uh, putting on the panel this evening. Uh, before we start, um, I think it's important uh, to acknowledge that in Toronto, where the Monk School sits, a traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, Chippewa, and Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Um, Tonight, uh, with the student initiative at the Global Migration Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, we're talking about the Safe Third Country Agreement between the Canada between Canada and the U.S. Um, I hope that if you're tuning in, uh, you understand some of the basic contours of the STCA. Um, I think it's particularly important that we talk about it now, given where it's sitting in the courts and the court decisions around it but also uh, very importantly, the election outcome south of the border in the US. As a bit of background, the, the Safe Third Country Agreement was negotiated in the wake of the September 11th attacks and came into force at the end of 2004. Uh, it's fundamentally an agreement, a bilateral agreement between Canada and the US that recognizes that uh, each country is a safe place for us asylum seekers and that if asylum seekers uh, make a claim at official ports of entry on the land border, they can return, be returned to the previous country um, from which they transited. Um, between 2005 and 2019, 9,836 people were denied entry at the Canadian border and returned to the US. So that's an average of around 730 people per year, so a relatively low number in terms of Canada's overall asylum figures, and a very low number in terms of comparable countries that uh, receive asylum seekers. Um, it, in the summer, there was a, a federal court decision that struck down the Safe Third Country Agreement on the grounds that uh, returning people, returning asylum seekers to the US, uh, put them, uh, likely put them in detention, which was punitive uh, and inhumane and so abrogated their rights under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The government decided to appeal that decision. Um, that appeal is still pending, but they were granted a stay last month in that decision, which means that the Safe Third Country Agreement is still in effect um, pending the appeal, which uh, will be heard in February or March. Uh, and we'll consider a, probably a decision uh, sometime next summer. Uh, so that's it about the uh, Safe Third Country Agreement. And now I'm going to introduce our four excellent speakers for this evening. Uh, first, we have Chris Alexander. Um, Mr. Alexander is the former Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship under the previous Harper government and as a former MP for Ajax and Pickering. Heather McPherson is a member of parliament for Edmonton Strathcona. She's the New Democratic Party's critic for human rights. We also have Robert Faulkner, who's a research associate at the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary and has been writing on the Safe Third Country Agreement in Canadian immigration for some time. And last but not least, uh, we have Prasanna Balasundram. Uh, he's a staff lawyer for the Refugee and Immigrant Division at Downtown Legal Services. And very importantly for this panel, he's the counsel for two of the individual applicants in the judicial review of the STCA, which was heard November 2019. Uh, a little bit about the format. Each of the speakers is going to speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A with some previously prepared questions that'll last about another 20 minutes, and then we'll open the discussion uh, to all of the attendees. Um, so feel free. And for that, we are going to be using the uh, Zoom chat function. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Alexander to give his 
You're still muted, Chris. So, got it. I hope you can hear me now. Um, my um, connectivity isn't perfect here, but that's my problem. And um, the, the joy uh, of being together on this issue will eclipse any technical difficulties, I'm sure, because um, this is truly important. Uh, and it's timely uh, because of the US election, obviously, uh, but also because asylum and protection issues are at a crossroads worldwide. Uh, and the decisions, the, the, the attitudes, not necessarily that the Canadian government um, puts forward, though those are very important, but that Canadian society um, adopts with regard to the SDCA and other um, key uh, aspects of our, of our policy and leadership on uh, asylum are gonna be absolutely crucial to global debate and dialogue on these issues. Um, and here's why. Um, we are one of the only countries, I would argue the, the only large scale country uh, in the world today that retains a strong uh, cross-party consensus in favor of, of upholding international humanitarian law with regard to refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, we are, as everyone knows, resettling more refugees than the United States in absolute terms this year and indeed last year. We are processing uh, hearing asylum cases and, and indeed welcoming them on a large scale uh, in recent years at a time when the European Union, for example, having accepted a huge number of asylum seekers in 2014, 15, 16, it is, is basically accepting and, um, and adjudicating the cases of very few and trying to move uh, towards a situation where the law changes and the access of asylum seekers to Europe would be much more constrained. Indeed, there are many member states of the European Union right now that will not take a single um, resettled refugee or asylum seeker this year. And there's cross-party consensus in many of those countries uh, not to do so. So we are an outlier in a positive sense, not to say that we are perfect in any way, uh, but we have an interest in getting this right, both for ourselves and for the future of refugee policy and indeed refugees and asylum seekers uh, the world over. Um, so what's my position on this? Well, ever since uh, Donald Trump became president of the United States and thank goodness he won't be there much longer, it has been my very strong view um, that we should have suspended the Safe Third Country Agreement. And depending on events in the United States, that could have led to a longer term suspension and even consideration, I think, if our government had moved in this direction of termination of the agreement. Now with uh, a new uh, administration coming into office, uh, one that is obviously more committed to um, reviewing these issues and improving US performance on migration and refugee issues. Um, suspension makes much more sense than termination and obviously entering a, di a dialogue uh, as quickly as possible with the Biden administration on the future of this agreement would be the right way to go. But I still think uh, we should be suspending the agreement regardless uh, of the policies that this new administration puts forward because it will not be in their power to make uh, the United States, as Craig said, a safe place for refugees uh, or in the more specific terms of the agreement to, to meet the terms of full and free um, refugee status determination uh, in the United States because the problems have just gotten too big and it's not just detention. It's uneven adjudication of claims across different states and different tribunals where politics have um, really started to influence things in, in an unhelpful way. And it's the general course of US 
migration policy, which has excluded certain nationalities, been prejudicial to certain faiths, uh, and indeed um, constricted flows of refugees on a scale that we haven't previously seen in our lifetime. So I don't think there's any way a serious um, expert with experience in these fields could argue that the United States is a safe place for refugees today. Better than a lot of other countries still, yes. Um, uh, able to adjudicate many cases, yes. Uh, but safe uh, by the standards of the Refugee Convention and the other um, uh, international instruments whose principles we're supposed to be living up to in these difficult times, no. Uh, and so what would suspending the agreement do for us? It would um, do three things. First, uh, allow us to treat claimants more humanely. They would be making claims at points of entry, which are offices on roads with infrastructure and toilets and professional people who would be able to do their job. And we would be ending uh, this, in my view, scandalous uh, situation whereby asylum seekers who cannot get a fair hearing in the United States are crossing fields uh, in Manitoba or Quebec or elsewhere in the middle of winter uh, and facing all the challenges that they should not have to face. Um, visitors to Canada, asylum seekers making claims in Canada should come in through the front door, uh, not through the underbrush. Secondly, uh, we would be setting a higher standard for the United States, saying what we all really think, um, that the United States is not a safe place for refugees at the policy level. And that's what foreign policy and immigration policy, policy should be about. It should be about peer review, um, stating the truth, uh, helping each other get to a better place. There have been times in Canada's history, we all know very well, where we didn't do, do as well on these issues. Uh, today, we should take pride in the fact that we are in a better place uh, and not indulge in the fiction uh, that the United States is anywhere close to meeting the standards that we expect. Um, thirdly, we would be setting a higher standard uh, for the world. A and, um, you know, let's keep in mind, the European Union is trying to revise its, its, its um, home affairs policy in, in the wrong direction, I think most of us would agree. Uh, but there are many countries around the world that simply do not um, adjudicate asylum claims properly, that do not resettle refugees, uh, and if we are going to go back in a reset world after COVID to um, um, those kinds of migration policies, we will not be making progress at all. And we have a very important role to play in being a loud, prominent, and principled voice um, helping uh, show the whole world that this is part of the price of international citizenship and being a member of the international community you should be meeting these standards. And then finally, uh, there should be scope uh, with suspension of the Safe Third Country Agreement, I think for a larger discussion with the United States about migration issues and with our other partners. Uh, it's probably not good enough to only be accepting as um, asylum seekers and as asylum claims in Canada, those who happen to make it uh, to our front door, or as the situation now forces them to do uh, across the land border at Roxham Road or elsewhere. Uh, asylum seekers are people who are fleeing uh, because they fear persecution and have no other options. Most of the people who would qualify on humanitarian merit, if I can use such a term, uh, highest in the eyes of Canadians uh, have no chance of making it to Canada. A and so my um, view, which I put forward uh, in policy proposals years ago, is that we should have a certain number of asylum seekers that we are accepting uh, uh, and identifying 
beyond our borders in those parts of the world where we know people are literally fleeing dictatorial regimes or terrible humanitarian situations or conflicts for their lives. Uh, and we should find a way to include them in our asylum process um, in addition to the resettled refugees that private sponsors and the government bring here. And very final point um, to close off this initial part of the discussion, uh, to do any of this and all of this, uh, we have to look very closely in the mirror. And if uh, in comparison to our peer group, our friends and allies around the world who have usually done right, more or less right by refugees and asylum seekers, we see ourselves comparing fairly well. We have to be honest that there is one metric by which Canada has uh, gone downhill very quickly in the past five years. And that is the speed with which we hear and adjudicate asylum cases. Uh, when we left office in late 2015, there were around 10,000 um, new system uh, asylum cases to be adjudicated in the docket, in the backlog of the Immigration and Refugee Board. Today, by the latest figures that are online, which are for June 2020, the number is 90,000. Um, and Lex uh, from the Toronto Star had 85,000 as the figure, perhaps it's come down in recent months, but either way, 85, 90,000 is a historic high for the number, for the backlog of asylum claims in Canada. If we're going to have a successful discussion with the United States about these issues, if we're gonna be an example to the whole world on these issues, we've gotta get our backlog down and live up to the terms of our own legislation, which requires these hearings to happen quickly. Thanks very much, Tim. Excellent, Chris, thank you very much. And thank you for keeping it to exactly 10 minutes. Um, uh, and next we'll hear from uh, Heather McPherson, um, who's the NDP's critic for human rights. <laughs> Thank you. My goodness, it's a little bit of pressure to know that Chris was so exact in his timing. I hope I can I can be as as strong. Um, first of all, I want to say that that I am new to government. Uh, I was elected in in October 2019, and so so a lot of my perspective comes from a place of civil society. I worked in in civil society and nonprofits for a long time prior to taking on a role in in parliament. So I will be bringing my comments from that perspective as well. Um, but I do want to thank thank everyone for for coming today for being part of this conversation. I think this is this is wonderful that we are having this conversation. It is something that that needs to be happening, and of course, is incredibly timely. So so thank you for inviting me, and thank you for letting me speak for a few moments here. And I'll try to be uh, at ten point zero as well. Um, as everyone knows, on July twenty second, the federal Court Justice and Marie McDonald released a decision ruling that the Safe Third Country Agreement was unconstitutional. Um, you know, since 2017, since January 2017, when the Trump administration attempted to impose their travel ban, it became very obvious that the Liberal government could no longer count on the United States to live up to its international and humanitarian obligations, especially regarding fair treatment for, for refugees. As, as time passed day by day, there were more and more media reports of the horrific human rights violations that asylum seekers were subjected to in the United States. News reports came out of Trump's zero tolerance policy, the, the, the baby jails, that that is even a thing that we can say now, the, the ripping away of children from the arms of their mothers, deplorable conditions at detention centers, um, the children who now, whose parents are, are lost and can't be located. The refusal to recognize gender-based violence or gang violence as a ground for asylum claims, um, all of these dominated the headlines. Yet the, the Liberal government refused to respond and continued to maintain that the US is a safe third country for asylum seekers. It's truly one of the darkest moments in the government's handling of the refugee file. As you can imagine, people fearing for their lives and for the lives of their loved ones started to look for ways to get to safety, but because of the STCA, with the US asylum seekers, they're forced to take a dangerous journey, risking their life and limb 
to cross irregularly into Canada to safety. The federal court ruling states unequivocally that the Liberals were wrong to allow a policy that compromised the safety of asylum seekers. It makes clear that everyone, including those who face persecution, should have their basic human rights protected. So contrary to what Minister Blair has said in the past, refugees are not asylum shopping. Um, this decision reaffirms what, with ad, what advocates, what lawyers, what academics, certainly with what new Democrats and, and thousands of Canadians have argued from the beginning is that the safe third country agreement contravenes Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms by putting the lives of asylum seekers at risk. The NDP stands with groups who brought this case forward. Um, we have the Canadian Council for Refugees. We have, you know, Alex Neven, the, the group of Amnesty International, the Canadian Council for Churches and thousands of Canadians who called on the government to not appeal the federal court decision. Um, sadly, instead of doing what was right and honoring our international laws and protocols by accepting the court's ruling and terminating the agreement, the Liberals chose to follow the advice of the Conservatives and double down on turning their back on asylum seekers. Under international refugee law, the principle of non-refoulement is the cornerstone of refugee protection, yet Canada knowingly and willingly violated this basic obligation. In a press release, Alex Neve of Amnesty International said, quote, the safe third country agreement has been the source of grave human rights violations for many years, unequivocally confirming in this ruling, unequivocally confirmed in this ruling. That cannot be allowed to continue one more day and is of even greater concern now given the prevalence of COVID-19 in immigration detention in the United States. Canada should further revoke the order in council which practically closes the border to refugee claimants as part of Canada's COVID response, end quote. By appealing this ruling, the federal liberals are saying that they would rather let people seeking the safety of asylum here in Canada suffer under Donald Trump's rule than stand up for human rights and Canadian values. The court struck down the safe third country agreement because they found that asylum seekers who were turned back to the US through the agreement are routinely imprisoned and placed into solitary confinement in retaliation of their seeking refugee, refugee status in Canada. This is not only a violation of basic human rights enshrined in the charter, it's a violation of the international law and puts asylum seekers lives at risk. It is heartless and it is shameful and it is, I have to say, it's very un-Canadian. Now, I know that you're thinking that things have changed that, you know, in the last little bit, I don't know about you guys, but there's been quite a focus in my, in my household on what's been happening in the US. Uh, we have had an election. I am utterly delighted that we no longer have to say the words President Trump and that Biden and Harris were successful and have won. Um, it's a big relief on a whole bunch of levels. I come from a background of international development, so you can imagine how, how um, excited I am from that as well. Um, so people are often saying, but now we don't have Trump anymore. We don't have to worry about this anymore. Trump's on his way out of the White House, so this changes everything. Um, why should Canada still withdraw from the STCA? And frankly, the answer is simple. The, the, the truth is that the STCA predated Trump and the US mandatory detention policy upon arrival for asylum seekers was also in place prior to the Trump administration. Without a major overhaul of the US refugee detain, detention system for refugees, the US is not a safe third country for asylum seekers, full stop. At this point, we have no way of knowing if this will be a priority for the Biden administration. And even if it is, it doesn't happen overnight. This is gonna take some time to change. Um, as well, for those who argue that if the STCA is suspended, Canada will be flooded with asylum seekers, I would argue that it will actually create more stability and order at our borders by allowing asylum claimants to make an asylum claim at an authorized point of entry with established infrastructure, with personnel present that will allow the RCMP, the Canada Border Service Agency to make better use of additional funding and staffing to deal with the increase in asylum claims. It will also increase security around Canada's border communities. And to be clear, Canada is not 
experiencing a border crisis. We are, due to our geographic position, merely seeing an increase in asylum seekers coming here in search of safety. Globally, there are 68.5 million forcibly displaced, displaced persons, 25.4 million are United Nations registered refugees, 40 million are internally displaced, 3.1 million are asylum seekers. Of course, Canada will experience an increase in asylum seekers arriving here, given the global context, but we have seen elevated levels in the past as well. In 2008, there were 36,920 asylum claims. In 2000, there were 37,845 claims. In 2001, there were 44,695 claims. It wasn't a crisis then, it's not going to be a crisis now. Um, What's changed is what we've been warning the Liberal government about since the NDP emergency debate when Trump tried to bring in the travel ban in 2017. Anti-refugee and anti-immigrant sentiment have globally risen since the Syrian refugee crisis. Um, European countries outright chose to close their doors to Syrian refugees fleeing violent civil war. Uh, we saw European, uh, sorry, the NDP was proud that Canadians did not um, adopt that approach. We lived up to our humanitarian ideals and responsibilities and we acted. But we also warned the government that this outpouring of humanitarian spirit could not be taken for granted. And if true leadership wasn't shown regarding the influx of asylum seekers, that Canada would not be immune to what's happening abroad. And sadly, the leadership from the government has created this vacuum in dialogue, which has been filled by a misinformation conference campaigns um, that insult, denigrate, and dehumanize asylum seekers. Just before the last election, the Liberals jammed amendments to the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act in Bill C-97, a 379-page omnibus budget bill. The change effectively rendered those who've made a refugee claim in the Five Eyes countries um, that they'd be ineligible to make a claim in Canada. And this was retroactive to the day the budget bill was introduced. The sad reality is that liberals took a page from the conservatives call to block asylum seekers from seeking protection in Canada, whether through the STCA or Bill C-97. You know, we, we can't forget asylum seekers. We can't uh, uh, forget the, the sight of, of Alan Curdy. We can't forget images of, of caged children in the US. Um, they should haunt us. Those images should haunt us. The Liberals need to step out of the shadows of the Conservatives. They need to do what is right. They need to honour our international obligations to the rights of refugees. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Heather. Um, Hearing a lot of similarities here around the implications of the STCA on Canadian leadership, uh, and I hope that's something that we can uh, talk about in the discussion. Um, next up, we have Robert Faulkner, who's a research associate at the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary, and is doing a lot of interesting research right now around uh, migrant farm workers as well. If you want to check him out. Craig, thank you for the, uh, for the invitation. Thank you to the, for the invitation from the student lab here. Uh, I'll just quickly comment uh, to the group here. What I commented to the other presenters beforehand is that if I look a little bit odd, like I'm not looking down at the screen, it's because my webcam of about 15 years quit on me today. And the, uh, the in laptop camera seems to be positioned right next to the bottom of the keyboard. So why they place it there, I'm not sure, but please bear with me if I'm, I'm looking away from the screen. Um, Craig, is it okay if I share just a, a, a couple pictures here right, and a couple of figures really quick, uh, just to illustrate kind of the, the point of my introduction? The floor is yours. You can do as you wish in the next nine minutes and 30 seconds. All right. Thank you. Um, folks, tell me here, which, uh, which screen? Are you seeing the presenter screen or are you seeing the presentation screen? All right. I'm going to go forward here. Um, Okay, uh, let's see here. Which, uh, are you seeing the presenter screen? Yeah, you're good now, Robert. Okay, perfect. What I really wanted to show off here, and, and this maybe will be the crux of, of my, um, uh, of 
my introduction would be uh, what, why, why fundamentally did we originally sign the Safe Third Country Agreement? Um, what is its, what, is, what has been the argument for its existence now? And then maybe the the primary sort of thesis of, of my introduction here is why I think it serves as a bit of a distraction uh, to the to a more fundamental problem with our, our refugee uh, claim system. Um, so that big orange dot there, right about a third way from the left hand side, that is when the STCA comes into force. That's when the Safe Third Country Agreement signed in 2002 co came into force. And what you can see there, what really predated it was a a um, rise in refugee claims. Uh, back in the in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, the then Liberal government signed the Safe Third Country Agreement um, in exchange for more information sharing between the Canadian and American intelligence agencies. Um, but what I what I always find somewhat interesting is that that dot where you see it placed, while it is marks 2004, it also marks the high watermark of of decisions for uh, refugee claims during that period. And one thing you might want to see here, I was doing some research on this a while back, and where it really began to strike me is that in the background, you, you see this gray peak. These are, are pending refugee claims. These were claims that are waiting to get processed. The blue line is when those refugee claims arrive, and the orange line is when we finally deal with those refugee claims. And I actually absolutely agree with, uh, with uh, Heather's point is that I think what we, what we might want to call it is a crisis of management rather than a crisis in claims. Um, we tend to have this history here where a, a spike in refugee claims will occur and it takes us about a year and a half to two years to, to get the funds, to get the necessary staff to the IRB in order to deal with this backlog in refugee claims. And um, we've tried, if you want to use sort of visual terms, what we've tried to do with things like the STCA and other policies is to really try to push the blue line down. I mean, if we can get fewer claims, we can deal with fewer claims. Um, and I, I think ultimately that might serve as a more a distraction to really what I think should be the policy is a, a faster, um, and I would also say more humane refugee uh, claim process. And I would say, by the way, I would say this is the same thing that you've seen in future surge, in, in other surges, um, sort of in the late 2000s, early 2010s, you see the same thing occur where you see a, a rise in refugee claims, a, a massive backlog of, of cases build up and, they, and the IRB begins to deal with it about two years later so because then they build up the capacity to build, do that. And I, I do make it, a, say it as a capacity argument. I'm gonna go forward here. These two show, the green line shows funding for the IRB and also the other one, the, the yellow line shows staffing for the IRB. And we tend to do this thing where we will see a rise in claims, we will fund the IRB to deal with it. And then during the lull period, we will um, reduce staff and reduce funding for the IRB. So then the next time a, a, a hike in claims comes around, we have an agency that's not really prepared or staffed in order to deal with it. And, and that's when we see this build up in claims here. Again, this is monthly data. This is uh, the most update data we have here. This is from October, 2016 through to September, 2020. Um, this is the rise in backlog cases. You see a, a rise in, in August 2017, major spike in, in refugee claims. And except for one month pre-COVID, um, the IRB has again struggled to bring that orange line, that is the decisions on refugee claims above the blue line. Um, <laughs> in some ways, COVID-19, if you're looking at this purely from can the IRB get cases processed, in some ways COVID-19 has been a bit of a, a blessing for them in order to play some catch up. Uh, but I don't think we should necessarily be relying on pandemics in order to manage our refugee claims system here in order to reduce cases. Um, one perspective I wanted to add here um, might be what the uh, both the liberal government's been doing and also in relation to the Trump administration over the past number of years. One thing we need to understand right at front is the entire Trump uh, immigration and asylum system was built around the idea of can we cut as many immigration admissions into the U.S. as possible and can we try to freeze out those who are currently inside the U.S. That was the from economic immigration and high-skilled visas to its uh, refugee claim system, to its refugee resettlement program. The entire um, US immigration system was designed of, can we reduce as much as possible immigration to the United States? And this was, by the way, largely a project of Stephen Miller, who was uh, President Trump's immigration czar during this period. At the same time, I, I think 
even if you disagree with that, I think it's important to sort of what I just describe what I think might be a bit of the liberal government sort of rationale for doing what they've done. And this is not necessarily me arguing in favor, but I think this is from what an outsider's perspective, what I think what they've been trying to do. They were operating in a bit of a foreign policy tightrope. I think there, there was this awareness at the federal government that that the Trump administration's policies, especially with regards to detainment, family separation, also refoulement, that's the return of, of refugees to unsafe situations. I think there was awareness that there was always, there was gonna be a possibility of suspension. But also with suspension came the potential for offense. I don't think it's any secret, even among supporters that um, the Trump administration was a pretty mercurial one, easily to take, easy to take offense. Um, I think there was also an awareness that the current policy in some ways fit with US migration policies. You had very few refugee claimants arriving into Canada and then transverse, traversing over to the United States. You had more coming to the US and traversing north of the border into Canada, whether at a port of entry or through regular means at places like rocks and roads. So I've gone, I've honestly gone, and that, sorry, one thing I'll also say there is that there was also this environment of other negotiations going along. There was the Trump administration pushing Canada and other NATO countries to up their defense spending. There was the renegotiation of NAFTA. And so I think there was this, this awareness on the liberal government's part that we want, they wanted a renegotiated STCA, perhaps hoping that would reduce the number of new claims, um, but also an awareness that it would um, be suspended as well. Um, Overall, I, I think there was little indication. I, I thought about this, if the US may have wanted the, the agreement suspended from just the perspective it would push more um, asylum seekers north of the border into Canada. I've also thought about would they want it renegotiated, meaning that would they want a stronger agreement where we could send back anybody to the US if they transited through it? I, I think in favor, it, overall, I think the, pic the picture that we see painted from the past number of years is that there was little to suggest that the U.S. was interested interested in renegotiating the safe third country agreement, and even if it was suspended, there was still a possible. Even if it still worked in favor su with suspension, um, I think it, there was still a possibility that even so, there was possibility of offending uh, President Trump was very high. So I just want to describe that was sort of the 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 environment in which the current government has been operating the past number of years. One thing I'll just finish off here really quickly, does the Biden administration present an opportunity for Canada to reform um, its immigration, uh, to, to renegotiate this kind of safe third country agreement? I think in some ways, yes. Um, overall, no. And I, where I say this is I think the Biden administration, if it chooses to end its detention policies and refoulement policies of the Trump administration, I think certainly makes the case that the, FC, uh, the Federal Court of Appeals a little bit harder. But that said, I think there is also an opportunity here for the federal government to renegotiate a stronger agreement, as indicated in the Biden um, platform, which is that one, they want more intelligence and security sharing with the Canada and Mexico, but they also want to reorganize, they also want to organize a regional resettlement program, um, which I could see Canada arguing for a, a renegotiated agreement in exchange for more uh, Latin American refugee resettlement. That said, I don't think this is particularly high in terms of uh, policy priorities for the Biden administration. So I think it's remains somewhat unlikely. Um, I think overall, again, I think my opinion of the STCA is that I think even from a purely utility perspective, ut utilitarian perspective is I think it serves more as a distraction for our fundamental issues. We have a very poor case management system that's more reactive and very sluggish at, at its reaction um, in comparison to other systems. And I'll finish off with this really quick. I know I'm coming up on time here. I think we need to start looking at other lessons from other jurisdictions. These are, by the way, the French and Swedish systems, which, by the way, I, I think they do have their issues. But one thing you can say about them compared to ours is they've been much better at reacting to um, f uh, flows of refugee claims, which do tend to go up and down. Um, I think we learn we can learn fu different funding models, different staffing models, and uh, different procedural models that could be applied to our system, which I think might ultimately be the better um, response to, to refugee claims in Canada along with more inventive refugee resettlement and, and other economic and family reunification pathways for um, humanitarian considerations as well. Um, that is it for my presentation. I'm sorry, I, I know I went a little bit over Craig, but I'll end right now and uh, turn it over to Prasanna. Great, thanks. Cool. Thanks very much for that, Robert. But, but I think that it's important that you brought in the international policy context um, in addition to the domestic capacity context, but 
I think that it's also important to keep in mind that, um, that none of the decisions around the STCA uh, and how to deal with the increasing claims uh, between ports of entry, particularly at Roxham Road, um, that the that there was a very uh, a real and legitimate concern around uh, how, um, let's say, a less than stable uh, leader to the south might have reacted to different policy decisions. Um, and our last speaker tonight is uh, Prasanna Balasundram. Um, I'm really looking forward to these comments given his close connection to the case in front of the. Uh, thanks so much, Craig. Um, so let me just say at the outset what my position is. It's simply put, the safe third country agreement with the United States should be terminated. Um, the United States has not and does not presently meet Canadian legal requirements to be designated as a safe country for refugees. I would note that pursuant to section 1022 of the Immigration Refugee Protection Act, Canada must consider amongst other things the policies and practices of the United States with respect to claims under the Refugee Convention, as well as its obligations under the Convention Against Torture, as well as its human rights record. And I think a review of the policies and practices of the United States, as well as its human rights records, reveal that there are certain long-standing features of the United States asylum system that simply make it unsafe for refugees and increase the likelihood of refoulement. I just want to um, go over uh, three of these uh, features and perhaps I, I'll, I can explore them in some depth um, later on in the discussion. But uh, the first is the one-year bar. There is a requirement under United States asylum law that an asylum seeker has to make their claim for asylum within one year of being in the United States. Now, they can still make a claim, but beyond that one year, but they must meet certain exceptions. And the deliberation of that claim is based on restricted or narrowed grounds. Um, the evidence clearly shows that the one year bar has an adverse impact on claims based on sexual orientation as well as gender based uh, claims. This isn't sort of hard to imagine if you've gone your whole life being fearful of expressing uh, your sexual orientation, you might not be so willing to do so even when you feel you've arrived in a country um, where you have the legal option of uh, pursuing an asylum claim. I would just note that there is no equivalent bar in Canada. Um, the length or delay, I should say, in making a claim in Canada is assessed under what's known as the subjective fear branch of the legal test that needs to be met for asylum. And um, it's essentially an analysis that uh, is undertaken by a Refugee Protection Division member as to whether or not there's a reasonable explanation for why someone might not have claimed immediately after arriving in Canada. The second feature of the asylum system in the United States that I believe um, makes it unsafe for refugees has been the inconsistent and restricted treatment of gender-based claims. You know, I think um, Chris sort of spoke about um, Canada's kind of leadership in terms of refugee issues. Um, you know, Canada was the first country, the first signatory to the Refugee Convention that recognized gender as a particular social group for the purposes of assessing uh, refugee claims. So not only was there this legal recognition, but the Refugee Protection Division of the Immigration and Refugee Board developed guidelines for assessing gender-based claims. So there are specific guidelines in terms of how it is, evidence and certain procedural accommodations ought to be made in order to meaningfully assess a gender-based claim. These gender guidelines are considered a model um, globally and have been adopted by other countries looking to see how they might be able to determine gender-based claims more effectively. Now contrast that with the United States. Uh, the United States law has only recognized certain very specific formulations of gender-based claims under the particular social group nexus to the convention. Uh, again, I, I believe it was Chris who mentioned that there has been historically very uneven adjudication 
depending on the region within the United States in which these claims are brought forward um, as to whether or not a, a, a gender-based claim would even be recognized. Now, notably during the Trump administration, Attorney General uh, Jeff Sessions rendered a decision in a case called AB that actually stripped the availability of protection for women fearing persecution at the hands of non-state actors. So this would be you know, a former domestic partner and it could include um, gang-based violence. Um, thankfully, a recent uh, decision from the Ninth Circuit of the United States Appeals Court overturned that decision. But again, speaking to the point of um, uneven adjudication, that appeals court decision is not binding nationwide. So it still could be the case that there may be uh, areas within the United States um, that would fail to recognize uh, this particular form of gender-based claim. Finally, I mean, and I think um, Heather spoke quite passionately about this, and that is um, the immigration detention situation in the United States. Um, the United States operates the largest immigration detention system in the world. There's an average daily population of about 42,000 people held in immigration detention. That's up from about 15,000 since 2000. And I want to pause here to just emphasize that 12,000 of the children, uh, 12,000 of the people that are held in immigration detention as we speak are children. And 70% of the detainees are held in private for-profit centers that are contracted by ICE. Um, you know, I, I threw up Justice McDonald's decision um, in the uh, constitutional challenge to the Safe Third Country Agreement, and, and Heather um, mentioned this as well. You know, there is some very compelling findings of fact by Justice McDonald that, that you ought to review and reflect on. Um, you know, crucially, what Justice McDonald found was that there's a direct link between the STCA and detention. There is a chain of custody whereby an ineligible refugee claimant, so someone who comes to the Canadian border uh, to the port of entry, makes a claim for a refugee determination, is determined to be ineligible to make a claim by virtue of the operation of the STCA, they are transferred from CBSA into CBP authority. There is a direct chain of custody there. And that chain of custody lands that refugee claimant in immigration detention in the United States. And I just want to draw you know, specific attention to paragraphs 95 and following of the decision um, in which Justice McDonald states, in this case, in the case of the applicant, Ms. Mustafa, upon being found ineligible, she was returned to the U.S. by CBSA officers and immediately taken into custody by U.S. authorities. She was detained at a Clinton, at the Clinton Correctional Facility for one month and held in solitary confinement for one week. Again, I just want to pause for a moment to say that the Clinton County Correctional Facility is not a dedicated immigration detention facility, but it's a criminal hold whereby immigration detainees are housed alongside uh, people that are either serving sentences or awaiting trial on criminal charges. Justice McDonald continues at paragraph 96, Ms. Mustafa's imprisonment evidence is compelling. In her affidavit, she explains not knowing how long she would be detained or how long she would be kept in solitary confinement. She describes her time in solitary confinement as a terrifying, isolating, and psychologically traumatic experience. Justice McDonald goes on to explain how she lost 15 pounds uh, because she suspected that she wasn't being given food that respected her religious beliefs and uh, explains sort of the, the, the conditions of her detention and um, finally, she notes that Ms. Mustafa states she felt scared, alone, and confused at all times, and that she did not know when she would be released, if at all. The ACLU, um, Amnesty International, have raised condition have raised um, many concerns about the conditions of immigration detention in the United States, and uh, I think Justice McDonald's decision independently uh, corroborates or affirms uh, these concerns. Now, 
What I want to emphasize is that these are long-standing features of the United States asylum system. These are not creations of the Trump administration. And I feel like that is something that has been lost in all of this discussion about whether or not in, in sort of the immediate aftermath of some of the more concerning developments in the United States um, that you know, Canada should suspend or terminate the, the safe third country agreement. This has been a uh, long-standing continual uh, decline or erosion uh, of the, the asylum system as compared to uh, some of the features of the Canadian system, which, which frankly, um, you know, uh, have, as I said, at least in certain respects, been viewed as uh, from the legal protection standpoint as a, a bit of a model. Um, but that's not to, to, to understate or downplay the uniquely Trumpian developments. Um, you know, again, Heather did a really good job of, of cataloging sort of the, the horrors that we, that we witnessed um, our partner in this agreement undertake, um, you know, everything from the Muslim ban, which was upheld uh, in its third iteration or so by the US Supreme Court, um, the separation of minor children, including babies, uh, which, you know, in the most recent sort of litigation um, that I've seen, we have seen uh, Department of Justice officials from the United States concede that some of these children may never be able to reunify uh, with their families. Um, we've seen essentially deliberate and concerted efforts to halt the possibility of asylum claims at the southern border. And finally, you know, in the most recent kind of news that I've been following, um, there was a report in The Guardian about ICE officials compelling asylum claimants in the United States who are in immigration detention, who, who have pending asylum claims under torture to sign deportation papers to facilitate deportation to Cameroon and other African countries. So, that, that's just a, a, a quick, <laughs> quick and dirty uh, summary. You know, we could get into each one of these, these issues much deeper, um, but certainly uh, these have been uniquely Trumpian developments. So the, the legislation that I noted at the outset obliges Canada to perform a continuing review to ensure that the designation is met. This is a legal requirement. This is not you know, as some of my, my co-panelists have said so eloquently, there are certainly questions about policy um, and sort of the stance that Canada might want to take on, on a global stage with respect to the refugee issues. But this continuing review is a legal requirement. And um, in response, what I say is, you know, how can Canada credibly view this vast body of evidence and do nothing? You know, at the very least, it could have suspended the agreement pending a comprehensible, a comprehensive rather, meaningful and comprehensible, uh, transparent review, um, but it did not do that. Canada has failed in this respect. And in my view, if it had failed in this respect, set against what is such dramatic and overwhelming evidence, I can't see it acting when there under a continued slow erosion that we saw prior to um, the, the, the Trump administration and what I anticipate will happen um, even with this change in administration because I think it is important to note what Canada has failed to do, what the United States has done, what many European countries have done is part of a trend whereby states are devising mechanisms that have the authority of law to resile from their obligations under the convention. So whether it's through safe third country agreements, whether it's through interdiction efforts, um, you know, whether it's through these complex um, sort of webs of security information sharing, um, these are all features, I think, of a uh, trend uh, that, that we can point to in which uh, states are, are really um, 
attempting to, to narrow, shrink, restrain, restrict the ability to access uh, asylum and, and narrow the grounds upon which asylum is granted if, if people can ultimately even uh, make it within the territory to, to make that claim. So I'll leave my comments there and I'm happy to, to take up um, any of what I've, what I've mentioned in the course of the discussion. Thanks, Prasanna. That's, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, as long as you study this, uh, the, in, in my experience, the, in particular, the separation of children and infants uh, on the U.S. border is, is shocking and continues to shock me. It's so find it incredibly difficult to listen to and contemplate the motivations behind that. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, we're going to move now to the to the Q and A section. There are several questions already in the Q and A, but we have a few uh, prepared questions that that I kind of want to get through. Um, Maybe I'll intersperse those with the questions from the audience, but I think one of the fundamental questions here for me um, is why the STCA in the first place and, and has it been effective? So in the late 90s, there was you know, a surge of asylum seekers, predominantly from Latin America, fleeing uh, civil wars in Latin America. Uh, Important to note that the that the U.S. government funded those uh, wars and perpetrated many of the abuses that led asylum seekers to come to Canada. The U.S. had no interest in signing an agreement until September 11th, when the Canadian government took that opportunity to include it in the bilateral Smart Border Accord. Um, if we leave aside the ethical concerns for a moment and just look at the effectiveness of the STCA. Has it been, in your opinions, uh, effective in deterring asylum seekers from asylum venue shopping? Um, specifically, you know, we saw the numbers before, but since then, in the intervening um, almost 15 years, the number is uh, fewer than 10,000 people have been returned at the border, which is a a tiny number in terms of overall asylum claims in Canada. So is the STCA fit for purpose? Did it do what the government of the day wanted it to do? Um, and anyone can open this. Maybe we'll start with Chris from your previous experience in government. And then I think Robert also wants to get. Sure. Well, everyone will have a, will want to take a, uh, a kick at this, but in my view, no, it didn't uh, serve its purpose. And the purpose was not, uh, a very noble one. Um, let's be honest, it was only signed in 2002 because of the new situation created by 9-11. Uh, the concern, the, the, the overriding security imperative, um, paranoid and overreaching and misguided as it was at the time in the United States to prevent people from coming to the United States who might represent a, th a threat. And it's only with, because of that additional layer of national security concern that the United States agreed to this because they didn't want more people that they didn't know much about arriving from Canada. Um, for Canada, it was part of a general uh, move, I think under the government of the day to try and bring the asylum system under control, regularize it. Um, and yes, there is an issue in asylum policy general around the world about uh, jurisdiction shopping. There are a certain number of people who do this. Um, you know, organized crime can be involved in inducing flows of people to do this. But that's really beside the point because um, asylum seekers uh, who have legitimate reasons for making their claims are the much larger group. and. Um, and I think Canada's interest is in what was said earlier, better management of our own institutions and better policy uh, debate internationally to try and focus on the asylum seekers that actually deserve the world's attention and the attention of leading countries like Canada. We shouldn't 
uh, in my view, be thinking only uh, of asylum only for those who manage to show up at our borders. They tend to be the ones who can afford a plane ticket or um, who have passports. And there are huge categories of very deserving uh, persons facing persecution, facing uh, danger to life and limb who, who deserve to be part of the system, if not as resettled refugees, then as asylum seekers. And they're so far being left out of the debate altogether. And I think the, the uh, Safe Third Country Agreement left them out of the debate. It sort of parked that debate. Um, and for the last four years under Trump, we have been, as several of you have now said, I think Prasanna most, most strongly, we have been complicit in Trump's uh, human rights violations, uh, some would say violations of international law. I think I would be among those saying that. Uh, and his outrageous um, uh, policies and rhetoric on these issues, which have really wrecked uh, and set back the asylum system globally uh, in, 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 in very serious ways. Uh, we should be speaking out against those abuses. Uh, we should be doing it publicly and we should have dropped the safe third country agreement. Suspending is a, basically the same as termination if you extend it uh, from the very beginning uh, of, his, of his time in office. I'm also quite upset with UNHCR, uh, which is the international body um, uh, charged with safeguarding these principles uh, and whose diplomacy, if there has been any towards the Trump administration on this has been pretty uh, discreet. They have not had the courage of their convictions. They have not spoken out. And I think that's cost us all as well. Robert, did you want to go next there? I, I know that you've given us some thought. For sure. I did see uh, Heather on mute here really quick too, so I'm also happy if uh, if she wants to step in here really quick. No, Robert, you go ahead and I'll, I'll jump in after you. Okay. Thanks, Heather. Um, yeah. I, in some ways, my, my views have kind of already been shared on this, but I, I guess I'll, I'll reiterate here is that um, leaving aside the ethics, and there's always a sticky area. I don't necessarily love, you know, there's this big question, should we even be leaving aside the ethics? But even uh, I, I am the from this policy school, so I'll even talk about it from a, a, a pure policy perspective right here, is that not only are a lot of the aspects of the STCA unethical, but they're just not good policy. They, they I don't think they serve the purpose that, that they were written to to provide, which again, uh, was to deter people from from claiming asylum in Canada who were transiting through the US, some of whom, um, some of whom, um, uh, to echo Chris here, some of whom are gonna have a, a minority of whom are gonna have what we would call unfounded cl asylum claims. They don't necessarily have a good reason to claim protection in Canada. The majority of whom are going to have good reasons for, for seeking protection of, of Canada's laws and seeking refugee status. Um, I, I think my, my well, I'll say what, what the STCA has done, and I'm actually gonna borrow a, a phrase from you, Craig, from an article you wrote for foreign policy a while ago, is that what all the STCA ended up doing was creating what, what Craig called one of his articles a de facto humanitarian corridor where people learned which areas of the border they could cross um, and claim asylum in Canada. Is, um, is that good, bad? I, I, think, I think that again, we come back to the whole, um, from a policy perspective, I think we need to work at putting our own house in order with how do we deal with, um, with changes in, in asylum claims. I mean, I have another opinion is what we could do. Um, uh, to again, jump off what Chris said, I think we expand um, current humanitarian programs to consider both refugee resettlement as well as asylum claim process for, uh, there, used, there used to be a program called, actually called the Source Country Program, which I, I think might be worth considering reviving, which was, this is for internally displaced persons. Normally, for those who are, may not be familiar with this, normally people who are not outside their country of origin are unable to claim refugee status or unable to be re resettled as refugees. And the Source Country Program was a way we could help people who were either in camps and cities or in other locations in their home countries uh, come to Canada. A good one right now that I, I've been pushing a few MPs on have been, um, you know, we might even want to look at the Hong Kong situation or, the, or situation in places like Xinjiang and where we will arrange, actually and we, we've kind of done this, by the way, I'm, I'm jumping a bit over all over the place, but we've done this somewhat recently with the Rainbow Railroad program, which is we basically helped people leave from places like Chechnya and Iran 
and come to, directly to Canada to receive protection here. And I think we, we open up programs like that and I think we put our own house, own house in order. Um, Prasanna will be familiar with this working sort of, not working directly for the IRB, but working in and around the IRB. Um, I think we need better training for the staff and a more robust staff at the IRB. If our concern is unfounded asylum claims, let them come in and let them go through the process, um, let them, whether it's through appeals or, or whatnot. Um, make sure the door is, is there for those who have well-founded uh, claims of protection, or even maybe not, are not sure whether or not they have well-founded claims for protection, but are nonetheless in fear um, for various reasons of their home country. Um, that's my answer in a very big nutshell. Um, but again, better case management, more expansive um, options for those outside our borders. Craig, I might just jump in as well, if that's all right with you. Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, every time I hear the, in a nutshell, I always, of course, envision the, the guy in the nutshell in the comedy. But anyway, um, I think when you ask the question fit for purpose, the thing that, that comes to my mind is it was, was the per purpose chaos? Like was the purpose supposed to be, you know, a, a chaotic system? Because that's what, what the STCA has actually given us. You know, we, we have people embarking on dangerous journeys to, to Manitoba, to Quebec that are risking their lives to get, to get here. This is, this is not a, this is not a fit for purpose program in any sort of way. Um, and, you know, we, we look at this and we think they are risking their life and limb. We've got very, very cold winters. They're vulnerable to harsh weather conditions, but they're also vulnerable to the exploitation from, you know, consultants and agents and, and people who charge significant sums of money to get them near the border. And, you know, Chris talked a little bit about organized crime, and that seems to me like an excellent opportunity for organized crime to be in, in, inserted into the systems and into the policies. Um, it's, it, you know, all of this is very, very policy and very theoretical, but but these are people and, and none of them are choosing to walk across Manitoba in the winter for fun. Um, they are not crossing because they have other options. This is this is this is an absurd sort of um, idea that, that, that this is a fun thing to do. I don't I don't think that that's what we need to be looking at. Um, you know, this is causing chaos. We saw Mr. Muhammad, for example, he's, the, he's the, 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 the gentleman who lost his fingers to frostbite after walking for seven hours in the middle of the night looking for emergency shelter. This isn't normal. It's not orderly. It's not working. Uh, it needs to be withdrawn. Absolutely. I, I agree with, with my fellow panelists, and so I'm not gonna repeat myself. I will just make a small, but I think important point uh, overall, and that is this conversation about the government of the day. You know, As we've discussed, the safe third country agreement with the United States was negotiated, I think it was December of 2002, brought into effect sometime in 2004. What is important to recall is that the provisions that authorized the Canadian government to enter into safe third country agreements was first introduced into Canadian legislation in 1988 under the predecessor Immigration Act. There were attempts to negotiate a safe third country agreement with the United States during the 90s that failed. And it was 9-11 and the immediate aftermath of um, you know, security concerns and increased cooperations that, that provided that window for the Canadian government to secure this agreement that they had been seeking for um, you know, some time. And I, I'm not you know, so sure on my political history, but if I'm, if I'm remembering re correctly, you know, that initial introduction of the concept of a safe third country agreement came into place under a conservative government. It was pursued in terms of an agreement under a liberal government ultimately crystallized in an agreement under a liberal government. And what we see is that once these sorts of agreements and restrictions come into law, it's very difficult for subsequent governments to come in and have the political courage to revisit them and to resolve from them. And you know, there have been developments in, in 2013 um, under the previous conservative government that, that bear this out. You know, there were restrictions um, around certain uh, claims from designated countries of origin, countries that were deemed initially safe, 
uh, it was ultimately the courts that found that those designations were, were unconstitutional. Um, and so, you know, we are still feeling the, the effects of the restrictions that came in 2013. This current government, I think Heather mentioned this under the, the Budget Implementation Act, introduced another ineligibility to claiming refugee status in Canada. And that is if you have initiated a claim for refugee protection, even if it has not been determined, if you've simply initiated a claim um, in the United States, New Zealand, UK, and Australia. So this is, you know, the five I security kind of sharing um, network that exists that results in another ineligibility for uh, claiming protection in Canada. And, you know, this is yet another way in which we're, we're restricting access to asylum um, in this country. And I, I'm really curious to see whether some, you know, um, successive government would, would revisit that. Um, so I just wanted to note that in terms of historical context. Yeah, I think that historical context is really important here, um, both for the fact that the, that the STC didn't come out of nowhere, but the assumption that um, in terms of how states uh, enact migration controls globally in Canada, while being a, a, you know, a policy leader on resettlement and some other aspects of international protection is also a policy leader on you know, visa policies that are used to keep people at bay. Uh, and things like the Safe Third Country Agreement. Um, we have uh, only 18 minutes left and several questions to get through. I'm gonna, I'm gonna couple this next question with, the, with a question from uh, Senator Omidbar. Um, so since 2016, since the, the increase of asylum seekers at Roxham Road, you've heard um, various people in the, in the Liberal government talking about what they're calling modernizing the STCA. Um, specifically, Minister of Public Safety, Bill Blair, has talked about this a lot. Um, I'm wondering if anybody has any insights on what modernization could possibly mean, um, other than extending the Safe Third Country Agreement to the entirety of the border and spending billions of dollars uh, on border security, um, as it's called. And I'm going to couple this with Senator Omidbar's question. This was um, kind of chime in here is whether or not the government was hedging its bets when it decided to appeal the decision and, and do, do people believe that that there's um, a political solution to this meaning a bilateral solution with the US um, as opposed to a legal solution and anybody can feel free to jump in there but I would ask you to please keep it to about a minute so we can get one more question. Sure. Well, um, go, ahead, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. Well, I, I can be very, very quick. I think that that it is, in fact, um, it's it's the same old thing. It's liberals doing the doing the talking and not the action. They're trying to they're trying to hold back on this. This is this is uh, this is again not doing what we need to be doing. They need to be working on the premise of human rights being the, the framework from which we make these decisions, not a political situation or political expediency or anything like that. There needs to be, you know, they, they, they need to have some courage to actually say, this, this agreement doesn't make sense. We need to pull out of this agreement, not kick the can down the road, not wait until they have an election and hope for a majority, which, which I suspect that they are very much trying to do. That's my short, my short, very political answer. <laughs> Yeah, and my short answer is that um, there, there, there can be no modernization of the SDCA without a major reform and improvement of U.S. immigration policy, U.S. refugee policy, U.S. asylum policy. This is the, the sticking point. Uh, and it was becoming a problem um, long before Donald Trump came into office. Now it is a much larger problem, which even the Biden administration will have a tough time undoing. The issue here is that the US hasn't reformed its immigration programs or its refugee programs in any thoroughgoing way for over three decades. Uh, and they were already overdue for those reforms in 2002, uh, when, you know, two decades ago almost, when the STCA was signed. 
Uh, we have, on the, on, on the other hand, been reforming and updating our program almost continuously, uh, meeting new challenges, adapting, learning, trying to get our management, trying to improve our management. And as a result, we're in a much better position to, to be able to say we are fulfilling most of our obligations or fulfilling our obligations most of the time. The U.S. cannot say that, and we can't have an SDCA with them until, uh, until major changes happen. And why has it not happened? Congressional gridlock. Uh, both parties have failed through their congressional representatives and through their successive administrations to bring about uh, a breakthrough massive uh, necessary reform. Finally, um, on Senator Omervar's question, uh, were they hedging? Of course they were hedging um, to see who would win the election and to try to uh, hold the line pending an election uh, here in Canada, as, as Heather says. But the bottom line is they have been complicit by keeping this uh, agreement in place while US policy went to the depths uh, of, of uh, non-compliance with international law, violation of children's rights, uh, the depths that we've ever seen in the post-war era. Uh, and I think that's a scandal that we as Canadians are all going to have to live with, uh, but this Liberal government really ought to have acted much more quickly. Uh, and, and I think it speaks to a lack of principle in their approach um, to refugees and asylum seekers. It was great uh, to pose for the cameras back in 2015-16 as Syrians arrived. We sort of topped out at 60, maybe 70,000 Syrians. In my view, uh, we as the only country accepting large numbers of Syrian refugees should have gone to 100,000 and perhaps we should have gone to 200,000. Um, uh, but we basically stopped and stopped talking about it and, that, uh, and instead let this huge backlog grow up. Uh, uh, 90,000 asylum claims, the largest in our history. There was no reason for that to happen. Sana, did you want to add anything there? Um, you may be on it. Sorry, Craig. I, if, I, I can move on to the next one if you wanted to jump in on a, on a more legal question. Um, so I'm also going to join this one with um, uh, with another question. Sorry, I'm managing several screens here. I'm going to bundle this question again with one from um, our colleague Marlena Flick from the Public Policy Forum, uh, and this is a question specifically around detention. So the the federal court decision focused very narrowly on on detention. Um, do you think that the so on rather than the broad range of changes in U.S. policy, which we've all spoken about this evening and we've all been following closely, but in your opinion, do you think that the federal court would have made the same decision under, for instance, um, um, a Clinton administration? So if there were a different administration? Um, and also, Marlena wants us to ask about the commentary on Canadian detention policy. Um, so does the conversation around Canada's practice, why does the conversation around Canada's practices around detention seems so uh, separate or hidden from advocacy to end or change the SDCA on the grounds related to US detention policies. Can I ask you to start off on that one since you argued the case? Yeah, sure. Um, so, sorry, I just wanted to throw up a link there. Um, and it'll make sense in a moment. But, you know, to answer the first part of the question, I, I do believe that um, the court would have made the same finding with respect to immigration detention had it been under a previous administration. And this goes back to, you know, the comments I made in, in my opening remarks, which is that immigration detention and specifically this chain of custody of ineligible refugee claimants from Canada being placed in US immigration detention has been a longstanding feature. It has been part and parcel of the operation of the Safe Third Country Agreement and that predated uh, the Trump administration. 
So um, I, I would say that, you know, it is important for, um, you know, the, the audience to know that the Safe Third Country Agreement was challenged uh, soon after it came into effect um, in 2004. And there was a decision rendered by Justice Phelan of the federal court, um, which I have provided a link to there. Um, I'm not going to get into sort of the, the, the details in terms of the legal issues canvas and what ultimately transpired, but essentially the federal court granted the application uh, and found that there were aspects of the Safe Third Country Agreement that violated um, charter rights at that time. The Federal Court of Appeal overturned that decision and leave to the Supreme Court was denied. So the effect of the legal proceedings at that time was that the STCA was uh, found to be constitutionally compliant um, and, and continued in effect. Now, what is noteworthy is that in the federal court decision that Justice Phelan rendered, he found um, very much, uh, you know, what Justice McDonald found with respect to the immigration detention component of, of, of things. And that is that the, the engagement of immigration detention in the course of the application of the STCA did engage security of person issues. And that the fact that someone would be in immigration detention in the US and then be subject to asylum proceedings there by virtue of being in immigration detention, it greatly restricted or narrowed their ability to advance their claim meaningfully. And you can understand this, you know, if you're attempting to speak with a lawyer um, over a, a prison phone, essentially attempting to gather evidence from your home country to support your claim, but you don't have the ability to make phone calls, access a computer to get, you know, emails, you can see how the evidence that you can gather in order to advance your claim um, can be prejudiced. The same kind of features and the same reasons why it is that um, Justice Phelan found this in, in 2007 um, exist to this day. We had evidence in this particular legal proceeding about how um, you know, one of the immigration detainees that we interviewed who was um, a victim of um, female genital mutilation had incredible challenges getting a physician to access the immigration detention center to do a physical examination in order to produce a report that corroborated her account. Such an important piece of evidence in her overall claim, but there was just this incredible, you know, barrier in terms of actually getting that done. And so um, all of this to say, I think all of the features that were present in previous administrations continue to be present today. And I, and I don't believe that there would have been a substantially different decision as um, you know, is the case when you review Justice Phelan's decision of 2007. Um, there was a second component to that and that I believe was about Canadian immigration detention. Is that? That's correct. The question was around um, why we don't pay any attention basically to Canadian detention policies when we're criticizing uh, U.S. detention policies um, as the as the rationale for uh, suspending or canceling the Safe Third Country Agreement? Um, well, I mean, the, the bottom line is, as it relates to the Safe Third Country Agreement itself, there are just far fewer numbers of overall people that are transiting through Canada in order to make a claim in the United States. And so the numbers of people that are pushed back into the Canadian system by virtue of the operation of the Safe Third Country Agreement are a mere fraction of the opposite, number one. And number two, it isn't the case that people who are pushed back into Canada by virtue of the operation of the Safe Third Country Agreement are detained in Canada for that reason. Now, there are a number of other reasons why someone might be detained in Canada. And there have been, I think, um, you know, legitimate criticisms that are independent of the Safe Third Country Agreement about Canadian detention. And um, I can throw up some links to, to some of that discussion, but as it relates to sort of the Safe Third Country Agreement itself, it's, it's for that reason. It's the overall numbers are quite low, relatively speaking, and there is no mandatory detention. There isn't that chain of custody into Canadian detention. And I would simply add, um, Greg, that when I was in office, I was, extremely uncomfortable with um, our detention system. 
there should not be, in my view, um, detained persons facing immigration proceedings of any kind in the correctional system. And unfortunately, there are in Canada. I'm not aware of the current numbers. Uh, and our system should be excellent, smooth, and uh, open to the extent possible. And I think there's room for reform there, as well as reform of the correction system uh, that goes well beyond anything I've seen in terms of uh, current thinking. Uh, but this is one of the neglected areas of our of our um, asylum uh, and refugee system that that needs serious attention in the near in in, in the near future. Um, given the fact that we have three minutes left, um, I'm going to interject here. I'm going to ask anybody if they have uh, in 30 seconds or less um, any closing thoughts on looking forward. Um, you know, we're, we're all trying to do objective analysis here, but there's so much around the Safe Third Country Agreement, around bilateral relations, around global mobility and international protection writ large, that is forward-looking. Um, and I want to ask if anybody wants to make any predictions or just put things on uh, audience members' radars in terms of what they should be paying attention to. Sure, I'll, uh, I'll quickly jump in there and kind of summarize my thoughts, like you said, in a few 30 seconds or so. Um, I, I think absolutely keep an eye on the upcoming Federal Court of Appeals case. Um, I, I actually I agree considerably with Persona here that the foundations for the current Trump administration policy have its basis in previous administrations under Obama and uh, potentially even under Biden as well. Um, and I'm happy to correct on this. One thing I, I guess where it makes things a little bit more, I think un somewhat uncertain is I think in general, the Federal Court of Appeals has a bit of a history here of being somewhat more restrictionist in mindset and uh, and somewhat reticent to, 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 uh, to make decisions on this view that might contravene current established policy. And, and do I think they'll take into consideration the change in administrations rightfully or wrongly? Um, I think they will. Does that make it? Does that mean that the case isn't there? Um, absolutely not. I, I think the case is still there from both pre and and post Trumpian policy. Um, final thought I would say is keep an eye on as well for what what it, does Canada start negotiating a larger both asylum and refugee resettlement program with the U.S. Again, this is something that has been put on the Biden campaign platform. My only caveat to my own point here is that how much political capital would would a Biden administration be willing to spend on that? But I, I think there is potential there for Canada and the US to, and the STCA might be part of this to renegotiate that, that one. Again, I think there's issues obviously with the STCA um, that, that require extensive reform of America's system. I think the Canadian government will be probably try to re renegotiate something regardless. Those are my thoughts. My thoughts are pretty easy. I think I've made it pretty clear. Um, right now, people are suffering. This is that we don't have time. We don't know if Biden is going to change things. We certainly know he's not going to do it quickly. He's not able to do it quickly. Um, the STCA needs to be withdrawn. That's like 15 seconds. And Greg, uh, I agree. The FD STCA shouldn't be our top priority. Uh, at the moment, it's it's unviable uh, anytime soon unless Biden and company can deliver really far-reaching reforms. Our main concern should be a helping the United States uh, recommit to all of these principles, b uh, leading by example um, in uh, having a first-rate asylum system, but also resettling refugees on a very on a much larger scale. And I think. Um, the new thinking in asylum should uh, be focused on the kinds of issues that Robert mentioned, identifying those who merit protection uh, that are far from our borders for all the reasons we know very well. And then thirdly, or C, we should be, um, we should be getting our own house in order. And that means an IRB that can uh, get its backlog under control, keep it under control, uh, detention centers that are first rate, uh, offices at the border and elsewhere that are tuned into these issues. Uh, and I think the IRB could be doing Zoom calls like this, like they're doing today for asylum claims in Canada uh, with people who are, who've never reached this country. 
uh, and our global network could help identify those people and set up the, uh, the, the infrastructure for those claims to be made. I put uh, a couple of ideas on those scores into um, some policy proposals in our last leader, two leadership uh, races ago. I put them up on online in case anyone's interested in continuing the debate. Um, Craig, just, just because I'm representing clients before the Federal Court of Appeal, I'll sort of respectfully decline from weighing in on, on the impact of the Biden administration on the case. But I will say this, um, I think what the panelists should be, not the panelists, sorry, your audience should be aware of is um, given the unprecedented numbers of refugees worldwide, um, what we need to be skeptical of are any agreements, bilateral or otherwise, that states enter into that have the effect of restricting access to asylum. And that is the overall trend that we should be mindful and be critical of. And I think the STCA is just one aspect of a set of strategies that states will increasingly pursue um, in order to, to push back and, and uh, constrain uh, refugee access. So I'll just leave it there. Thanks, Prasanna. That's um, a very important, um, if uh, some concerning and somber note to end on. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here this evening. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in on a Monday evening. Um, a special thanks to, uh, to Heather for jumping in uh, at the last minute um, to replace her colleague, Jenny Kwan. Um, and thanks very much to the uh, students of the uh, Global Migration Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy for putting this together. Um, if this were regular times, we would clap and now go eat bad sandwiches, but uh, I hope everybody's uh, going to do that at home. Uh, in some way or another. Um, all of our contact information is on the, is on the Monk School uh, website and we're all easily Googleable. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the discussion and have a great evening, everyone. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.